Hey guys, welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. The southern front in Ukraine extends over 350 kilometers from Zapotaria to Harrison. Each side is estimated to have approximately 30,000 troops stationed here. Ukraine reported that they recently started their major counteroffensive that they teased us about for the past few months. So the counterattack is centered around the southeastern city of Harrison. Ukrainian forces are advancing across open terrain here using highways E-58, T-1501, and T-1508. We're going to examine all the different tactics used by your average soldier on both sides. The two key features of the terrain that we need to know about are the Dnieper River and its tributary river, the Inulets. These cut up the battlefield and shape the challenges that each side is facing on the ground. Ukraine has already successfully crossed the Inulets River at some points. The position of these two rivers means that Russian forces could possibly have no way to retreat. It also means once Ukraine commits their troops to crossing that river, they might have no way of falling back if the assault fails. Being in that position for the soldiers on both sides is a terrifying prospect. When there's no way to escape, it means both sides are fighting an all-or-nothing battle. If Ukrainian armed forces are able to drive a wedge between the Russians in the southwest and those in the northeast up the river stream, then they could create a pocket of 10,000 enemy forces to surround. We see here, this is the location that Ukraine is driving their salient attack through. A salient means concentrating their advance in one location, hopefully at a weak point in the defensive line, in order to cut a division through the Russian forces and reach the rear of their defense. Harrison is situated on the southwestern end of the Dnieper River, which serves as a natural barrier between the southwest occupied region of Ukraine and the rest of the country. Military analyst Rob Lee pointed out that he believed Ukraine chose this location for their offensive because of the two rivers that surround the Russian forces. Let's talk about setting the conditions for victory. This concept is also called shaping the battlefield. So this fight was decided weeks ago. One of the first conditions that needed to be set was taking out three key bridges which cut off Russian forces from the main occupied territory. So it happens that the three constructed river crossings in the area are located within 60 kilometers of the city. Those are the only pieces of infrastructure connecting the city with the rest of the Russian occupied territory. And they're some of the most valuable pieces of key terrain in this operation. This means the next closest bridge is 130 miles away in Ukrainian-controlled territory in Zapateria. These strikes began in late July on these key bridges. You might wonder why it's taking Ukraine so long to knock these bridges out. If you look at these photos of rocket and artillery strikes against bridges in the region, you can see that it takes many multiple strikes on these concrete reinforced rebar bridges in order to knock them out of commission. The final bridge, the Anatonovsky Bridge, was destroyed on August 30th, preventing Russian troops from getting resupplied. Instead of relying on costly and risky wet gap crossings, setting up pontoon bridges that are giant targets for artillery, Russia has adapted here and instead chosen to ferry supplies across, which is much safer but also much slower. The 49th Combined Arms Army is chewing through their artillery ammunition right now, and the only way to get fresh rounds is by getting them across these rivers. This offensive comes on the tail of several weeks of strategic bombardment by Ukraine in the region. 16 days ago, on August 19th, it was reported that there were explosions in Nova Kavavka, near a key bridge that would cut off Russian forces' ability to retreat and resupply. Seven days ago, on August 27th, explosions at ammunition depots and equipment gatherings across Kherson region were reported. At the risk of sounding like a pretentious infantryman instead of an average one, victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. That's Sun Tzu, and I think the counteroffensive has already been won or lost at this point based on the actions taken in advance by Ukraine over the past few months. The offensive could not begin until Ukraine had struck a blow to Russia's aircraft advantage. On August 9th, a series of explosions damaged the Russian airbase at Novofordakia in Crimea. This reportedly took out half the Russian military's naval aviation strength in the region. The attack is strange because Ukraine doesn't officially have any missiles with a long range enough to carry out that attack, leading to speculation possibility that they received secret long range weapons from somewhere. Ukrainian officials have anonymously said that it was a guerrilla special forces operation that carried out the bombing of the Russian airbase. Some analysts believe it could have been done with drones that dropped off the bombs. If it was a long-range missile, Ukraine's not going to tell us because they don't want Russia to know that they have them. 
Ukraine's Southern Military Command operates 36 different battalions against Russia's 49th Combined Arms Army, which is made up of artillery brigades, air defense brigades, everything is consolidated into that Russian force. We know most of the exact tactics that Russia will use in defensive operations, thanks to the document written by Dr. Lester Grew and Charles Bartley's The Russian Way of War, which is a 416 page exhaustive study on Russian modern tactics. So Russia uses two different types of defensive strategies. The first is called positional defense, where they stubbornly attempt to hold defensive lines and refuse to give an inch to the enemy. The second strategy is called maneuver defense, where they choose to fall back to second and third line defenses on purpose while flanking the enemy when they attempt to move in. Of, uh, Ukrainian military operations that have made some forward movement, and in some cases uh, in, in the Kherson region, and we are aware in some cases of Russian units falling back. There are already reports of Russian units falling back to these second line defenses, which is a hint that they're using this maneuver defense strategy. Brigades in defense, according to the Russian field manual, have four lines of trenches in total. The second trench is 400 meters behind the first, and then the third is one kilometer behind that, and then another kilometer behind there is the fourth trench. Each time the enemy engages them, they elect to not become decisively engaged, meaning that they fall back to another trench they displace as soon as they take heavy fire. The goal is to draw the enemy into a trap. This means defenses are typically three to four kilometers deep, with artillery positions located at that edge. Something to look for here is if Ukraine pushes further than 10 kilometers deeper than the original first line of Russian defensives, because this means they will have completely broken to the rear of the Russian forces. But we have to keep in mind, the Russian field manual calls for fake positions to be created six kilometers in front of the actual defensive line to trick the enemy into thinking it's your main defense so that the enemy deploys their artillery early. By the book, Russian forces use this maneuver defense strategy to set up a row of sequential ambushes and minefields for the attacking forces to push through in order to inflict casualties and gain time. But the catch is, the only way maneuver defense works is if they have artillery and air power available. Russia has reportedly been purchasing millions of artillery and rocket rounds from North Korea this week, which shows that their stockpile is being quickly depleted. This is also why Ukraine has been using a concept called shaping the battlefield for the past two months. Shaping the battlefield is all about destroying these key artillery assets and air assets that are needed for maneuver defense. Another important thing that we learn from the Russian field manual on defensive strategy is that your average infantryman in Russia is unauthorized to withdraw without direct explicit orders from senior commanders. This is even true when the conditions are such that they're without communication or completely surrounded. They are still ordered to fight to the end, which shows this kind of top-down approach in the Russian military that they've had trouble getting away from. So what's at stake here? Well, there's three main goals that Ukraine is striving for with this offensive. The first is to gain access to the Harrison port, which provides crucial economic access to the Black Sea. Ukraine's future economic security is at stake here with this mission. It would put Ukraine within striking distance of ending the Russian naval blockade of their valuable port cities. If Ukraine can win here, it would threaten the Russian occupation forces western flank in Zapateria, the province where the Russian army is stationed at the nuclear power plant there. Based on what we've seen, Ukraine is using tactics straight from Russia's field manual for offensive maneuvers. They've modified it to account for a lower amount of tank numbers, and they've added in some Western doctrine, it looks like. Ukraine is advancing with their infantry on foot in some instances, stepping inside the wake of their tanks' treads to avoid stepping on landmines as they advance. This tactic is straight from the Russian field manual. As we see here, what happens next is that the infantry will move in front of the tank once they've reached within 300 meters of the enemy. They will clear a small opening in the minefield and push through while support by fire positions manned by armored vehicles line up in the rear about 500 kilometers back to provide covering fire for them. The fact that these soldiers are dismounted behind the tank here means that if they're following the book, they're about 400 meters within the enemy line here getting ready to assault through. If we assume that Ukraine is using Russian offensive tactics, they likely have three tank platoons spaced out by 600 meters, then 300 meters behind that first echelon, there's a second group with three motor rifle companies of M113s and BTRs. 
And then there's a headquarters and artillery unit about 300 to 600 meters behind there. I believe this is a very unusual counteroffensive because traditionally they're meant to reclaim large sections of terrain. Ukraine's goal here, I think, is likely to apply pressure to the Russian defending forces in order to make their position unsustainable in the long term. Instead, they need to cut off and stress the existing Russian forces until they have to leave themselves. A day ago, it was reported that the Zapateria MPP Power Unit 5 is connected back to the power grid after being disconnected due to mortar shelling the day before. Both sides have been accusing the other of endangering all of Europe by conducting strikes near the power plant in what amounts to a big game of pointing fingers, basically. Secondly, this city could potentially be used at any point in the future by Russian armed forces as a springboard to Odessa, which is Ukraine's last major port in the West. It's also currently used to launch attacks onto Karari, to the north, which is an important industrial manufacturing hub that produced 10% of Ukraine's pre-war GDP. Harrison is currently the largest Russian-held city with a population of about 300,000 people. It was one of the first to be occupied by Russian forces. Since its occupation, Russia has moved to hold referendums in order for the area to be claiming its own independence from Ukraine, which is exactly what they did in Donbass and Luhansk. And Russian efforts to accelerate this referendum are underway in order to declare an independent state before Ukraine can have a chance at taking it back. This means the third goal for Ukraine is the political win that comes with taking back the only major city that Russia currently occupies. Another weapon system that could have a major operational impact that hasn't been covered as much as the HIMARS is the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missile. So the harm was initially created by Texas Instruments, you know, the company that made the calculator that you used in high school algebra. It's also responsible for creating some of the world's most sophisticated weapon systems. If I had known that, maybe I wouldn't have failed math in class. In the past week, more and more footage of American harm missiles fired from Ukrainian attack aircraft have surfaced, being used specifically in the Harrison region. But one of the biggest impacts isn't even the destructive abilities, it's the intelligence gathering aspect. When switched to the harm as a sensor mode, it allows pilots to map out Russian positions using the warhead as a tracking system. The harm missile acts as an intelligence surveillance target acquisition system. It effectively paints a picture for ground commanders of what the Russian positions currently look like. So its greatest strength isn't even when it's fired, because they can detect any kind of equipment, whether it be radar jammer, anti-air battery, or satellite comms nodes. It means that anytime any of that equipment is on and operating, a Ukrainian MiG can know exactly where it is from an extremely long distance away. The HARM is an air-to-surface missile. Recently, a joint effort between the United States and Ukraine, HARM missiles were retrofitted to be able to be loaded and fired by Ukrainian Su-25 and MiG-29 fighter jets. As of March 11th, the Ukrainian Air Force still reported by the US defense officials to have 56 operational fighter jets. So based on the rate of losses over a five month period, we can assume that that number is approximately probably 15 to 20 less today. The harm is being used as an anti-radiation missile. That means that instead of thermal or IR signature locks, it locks onto an enemy's radar signals. The greatest benefit of this is being that no amount of camouflage or thermal covering can hide it from detection. The harm disrupts Russia's ability to effectively use any kind of radar signaling equipment. Russia is now forced to both constantly move their equipment to alternative positions non-stop around the clock, but also they can only risk using them at critical intervals. This means that if you're a SAM launcher, you're constantly moving from fighting position to fighting position, which tires you out, and you're only able to turn on your targeting system if you're absolutely sure that you already have a target in sight. The same goes for the communications and command nodes of Russia. Instead of a steady stream of information across the Russian lines, radio and digital chatter will now be limited to short critical windows, where all information has to be passed at once. And once that window's closed, entire command and control centers will need to be moved to new locations to prevent detection. Ukraine had to determine their goalpost for this operation. Originally, they were considering a much larger attack across the entire 350 kilometer southern front. But after the United States provided them with their intelligence assessment, they limited their goal to being more laser focused on the Harrison region instead. That makes the front line closer to 160 kilometers or 100 miles for this front. Deciding the scope of the mission can be the difference between success and failure. Imagine if Russia had focused all of their forces on Kiev instead of trying the blitz of the whole country. This calls into question how much the US military has helped develop this offensive plan. General Ryder stopped short of admitting that it was a US planned operation. 
This is what I mean by setting the conditions for victory before the offensive even begins. We will now see how successful these efforts were. Moving troops onto an objective is difficult and requires a lot of armored vehicles. We see here the Ukrainian soldiers are riding on top of the M113 carriers provided by the United States and other countries. The Russian defense strategy has also reportedly had some successes of its own. Russian military bloggers claim that their forces successfully dropped a fab 500 kilogram bomb onto Ukrainian positions in Bezemin. These massive aviation bombs that were dropped would make it difficult to mass the combat power for attacking forces. Russia claims to have destroyed a Ukrainian armed forces base at Baraganovsi and an ammunition depot warehouse in Belikonovka. And it'll be easier for them to hit targets that are exposed while moving, as we see here in this video released by the Russian Ministry of Defense, taken in the Harrison region. On July 31st, Russia began deploying units from other locations to reinforce the south. According to Russian military bloggers, Ukraine has advanced to the south, attempting to reach Novoya Kakova. They're leaving themselves open to being flanked from the north, according to Russia. And that's Russia's strategy here with the defense. They're hoping that they can overextend Ukraine and destroy them once they're in a vulnerable position over the river. There are two ways to look at the same map right now. You could see it as Ukraine salient advancing deep into Russian occupied land and they're getting ready to cut off Russian forces here. Or you could see it as Ukrainian forces trapped and overextended. Russian military bloggers confirmed, for instance, that Ukraine attempted to take the town of Bezemin in Harrison. But according to Russia, the advance there was stalled and failed so far. They have a serious disadvantage that could honestly spell disaster for the Harrison counteroffensive. Ukraine's first major issue, according to almost all modern military doctrine, in order to attack a defending position, you need a minimum of three to one ratio advantage of troops in order to have a good chance of success. This is because attacking is much harder and more dangerous than defending. The part of the world that Ukraine inhabits is not a place to be conducting tactical maneuvers during the rainy seasons, as many armies in the past have noticed. Precipitation during the autumn months transforms much of the land into deep, heavy mud, which bogs down vehicles, slows movements down to a crawl, and makes dismounted movement for troops much more difficult. By the end of September, temperatures will reach lows of around 52 degrees by October 41, November 33, and in December, they're gonna be freezing and muddy conditions, which will not be favorable for any Russian or Ukrainian attempts to advance. Looking at this factor, some analysts say that in order for Ukraine to be successful, they only have until October to complete their operation goals, which doesn't quite line up with Ukraine's claim of a slow and methodical advance. Soldiers themselves have begun to provide information on the fighting, with wounded Ukrainian soldiers returning from the front saying that the fighting is going well, but they're taking decent losses. And intercepted Russian communications say that the Ukrainians are throwing everything they have at them and are surrounding individual positions. From a military standpoint, it would have been better for Ukraine if they'd attacked a month or two ago, back when there were 10 less Russian battalion tactical groups in Harrison. Since then, Russia has reinforced Harrison with 10,000 additional soldiers in anticipation of this counteroffensive. I believe the ground advance could not begin until those bridges were destroyed and the ammunition depots knocked out. First, the Institute for the Study of War used open source data collected from NASA's Fire Information for Resource Management System, firms, that reportedly sent data for September 2nd that confirmed that there was an explosion and fighting and fires happening south of Harrison Elvik. It uses NASA's satellite fire detection system to locate where the combat is happening at all of the red dots featured here. This tells us that Ukraine has likely advanced in this location, and that's how we're able to get a sense of how this counteroffensive is unfolding so far. We have to look at other satellite images and sources. For Russia, successfully holding on to Harrison would show that all of the reports of their poor performance might be an exaggeration, and could mean further advances are in the cards. These victories in the war are also political victories that help with negotiations. Russia recently agreed to ease up their blockade of Ukrainian grain exports, allowing the first three ships to leave Odessa with over 58,000 tons of grain to reach 20 million people in Ethiopia who are facing starvation. 
This will provide 10 billion in revenue for Ukraine, and it's a concession that Russia likely would not have made if the war was going better for them. So a counteroffensive was an inevitable step for Ukraine. If it ever wanted to successfully remove Russia entirely from the country, instead of simply negotiating for what would be left if Russia eventually stopped the invasion. It's important to keep in mind that the Ukrainian president said that a negotiation like this would never be on the table, which tells us that the Ukrainian army's intention is to recapture all of their land lost still at this point. A successful counteroffensive would also reassure nations that the material aid provided, the training given to Ukraine so far, has not been wasted. This would lead to more weapons and equipment sent by NATO. What limited reliable reports that have recently been published show that most Ukrainian claims of retaking territory have been true as well as reports of Ukrainians paramilitary resistance fighters simultaneously harassing Russian positions within the city of Harrison itself. The Harrison offensive will take months, and as of now, it's going to be hard to make a call as to who will ultimately win this fight. But as of now, the Ukrainian army is on the march, and we'll see how far the momentum is going to take them. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video valuable in some way, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. It means a lot. And I'll see you all very soon.